combat can be one of the most difficult parts of a Dungeons & Dragons game for a dungeon master to run. It can very easily drag or just feel like things are taking too long. So in this video, we're going to answer the question of how you make combat exciting and compelling for your players at the table. Hi, I'm Jeremy, I'm a writer, and this is my YouTube channel where I make videos about all things imaginary. This video is another episode in my series called Experience Gain, where I talk about how you can get the most out of your Dungeons & Dragons game. Compelling combat starts with intentionality, an intentional approach to designing combat encounters that are interesting and engaging for your players. And there's really two key elements to doing that successfully. The first piece is narrative stakes. You need your combat to mean something. The second piece is creative resolution. Ideally, not all your combat is going to be resolved exactly the same way, just by killing the enemies directly head on. It might require a different strategic approach or might have different situational obstacles along the way. Not every combat encounter that you run needs both. In fact, in a lot of cases, just one of these is enough to bear the load and make your combat really engaging for your players. The first guideline I'll suggest to creating compelling combat encounters is consider the goals. And I don't just mean your player's goals, I also mean the goals of the adversaries that they're facing. Players, a lot of the times, even when they have larger goals to accomplish, can get easily distracted when there are monsters to kill. And depending on the group you have, you'll know how likely they are to stick to their goal in the face of oncoming enemies, or to set it aside until they take care of the threat. The place where you, as a dungeon master, have the most control is in controlling the adversaries, obviously, and in giving them goals that supersede the importance of defeating the players. In one one-shot that I ran, a group of players attacked an outpost, and the enemies gathered there put up a strong resistance, but their main goal wasn't just defeating the players. In fact, when they saw that things weren't going too well, the adversaries shifted tactics, and instead they were focused on lighting an alarm brazier that would signal the main base and let them know that they were under attack. The players had to try and stop the guards from lighting that brazier, or else they would spoil the element of surprise and the enemy faction would know that they were coming for them. All of a sudden, the stakes are higher because there's more to the combat than just defeating the enemies, and it's more engaging because it allows players to apply themselves more creatively. They don't necessarily need to prioritize doing as much damage as possible. Instead, they can utilize moves and abilities that might impair movement and vision or try to throw people off a battlement. Even if it might not do as much damage, it could still be a better way to impede them from accomplishing their goal. That's just one example. Perhaps it's not a defensive scenario and instead it's the players who are under attack. In this case, maybe the the NPC adversaries are there to capture one specific person, another NPC ally of the players, or if it's a character-specific plot, one of the characters themselves. I think the biggest failing of most dungeon masters when it comes to combat is that they see combat as an end in and of itself. And while it definitely can be and should be from time to time, some of the most fun encounters I've been a part of have happened when combat is more part of the process. It's the way that we engage with the story in that moment, but it's not necessarily the point of the story in that moment. We use combat to try to save somebody. We use combat to try to stop the enemies from accomplishing something. We're not just doing combat to try to kill everybody. The next guideline is to use action as characterization. I've talked about this a little bit before in the Monster Mastery series that I do from time to time, and I think it's especially key there. The way that the NPCs that you control engage in combat is essential to making the combat feel more narrative and feel more compelling. If all your enemies fight the same way, over time, you're going to set up a really boring standard of how combat plays out. Think about it as if you're actually role-playing that character in the moment of combat. How do they act? The answer to that question should be completely different dependent on the type of monster and the type of creature and the nature of that specific adversary. Do they stop and kill downed foes, or do they just move past the second someone falls unconscious? Maybe when they're beaten back, they try to run and hide, or maybe they grow berserk and grow even more feral, willing to throw their lives away if they can take down an enemy with them. All of your monsters should not act the same way. And usually that kind of behavior 
comes from a dungeon master's desire, which is a desire I feel too, to optimize your combat encounters, to have your monsters do as much damage as possible, to be as effective as possible. But effective monsters are not necessarily compelling monsters. It can be a lot more fun to see goblins scurry around ineffectively or have maybe bad tactics because they're unable to work really well together. It can add comedy and levity to a situation where there rarely is any in a combat encounter. It can also make dangerous foes that much more imposing when it's clear that they know what they're doing and when you want to be effective, when you want to apply all your knowledge as a dungeon master of how best to deal a blow to them, use that for a really powerful, really strong tactical enemy. That's gonna make those encounters hurt a lot more if you're varying the style with which each monster, each group of monsters engages in combat. It's not just about what your NPCs are doing though. It's also about the opportunities that you're presenting to the players at the table. In writing, there's a really core principle, which is that action reveals character. The best way to show what a character is about is to show it through the decisions that they make and through the way that they engage in the action of the story. Give your players opportunities to confirm or turn against the characterization of their character. One way that you can do this is to present them with hard choices. Maybe the bad guy has set a trap and the trap is going to spring on a bunch of innocents and the bad guy is hoping to use this to cover their escape. Will the player in question try to save the innocents or leave them to maybe die, at least struggle, and just try to go after the bad guy that they've been chasing? That question reveals something about a character. Some characters would go for the innocents and some characters would chase after the bad guy. Create more situations like this where there's not necessarily a right answer, there's just different kinds of answers. And depending on what kind of character steps into it, a different result will occur. If you have a player playing a cowardly character, give them something scary to overcome. Consider how you might be able to utilize fear as a mechanic to play into the role-playing experience that that player is going through. Or if one of your players is playing a mage hunter, well, give them a mage that they've been hunting after, but force them to sacrifice something, maybe even leave the party behind or separate themselves from the party if they want to go after this mage. These are difficult choices and they will arrest your player's attention making them more engaged in the situation in the overall combat encounter as they become focused on not only what they're doing, but how the situation around them is changing and evolving. That situational evolution also ties into the third guideline I wanna share with you, which is use the environment. In any combat that you run, you should ask yourself whether the environment should factor in. I don't think it should be a factor in every combat encounter that you run. It'll become stale and one note if there's always an environmental factor. But from time to time, you might find yourself in a really interesting setting where having the environment come into play can be really compelling and thrilling. Perhaps you're on a dock and there are barrels of loose gunpowder around. Or if you're an old temple, maybe the ground can fall apart under your player's feet as they're fighting. Maybe they even trigger traps as they fight, affecting both friend and foe alike. The environment serves to not only engage your players more and make them more aware of the unique nature of the place that they're fighting in, it also provides a set of creative obstacles and opportunities for your players to leverage. The Obstacles can impinge them, but players are creative, and so if they see interesting things in the environment, they might want to try to use those for their benefit. While they shouldn't necessarily succeed outright, you as a dungeon master should at least give them the opportunity to try. If you're gonna present something that might hurt your players, you have to be ready for them to turn it right back around on you. It's not about getting one over on your players by surprising them with an environmental obstacle. Instead, it's about getting them to think about their environment, to think about the setting, to get more engaged in that way. And if they come to you with an idea of, hey, I wanna use this thing in that way, can I throw the barrel of gunpowder at an enemy, hoping that when it shatters, it'll cover that enemy with the gunpowder, making them that much more susceptible to fire for the next attack. I would 100% allow something like that because it's cool and it's creative. And I love seeing players do that kind of thing versus just decide to swing their sword or do a standard attack because it shows that they're engaged, it shows that they're really thinking about the setting and how they can apply themselves to it. Using the environment in this way, if you wanna go a more narrative direction and you're okay playing a little bit more loosely with your descriptions and your adjudication, 
also allows you to factor in the environment into your narrative descriptions. Let's say two swordsmen are fighting, one a player and one an NPC. Well, if the player blocks a blow, instead of just saying you block the attack, in a forest environment you could say something like, the enemy's blade cuts into the tree behind you as you duck down. They struggle for a moment to pull the blade back out before they face you again with renewed vigor. That's a really easy, just off-the-cuff example of a way that now, all of a sudden, they're not just fighting a standard combat in a backdrop, they're fighting it in an actual setting, and the setting is factoring in to the situation, even if it's a really minimal, non-mechanical way. The fourth guideline I want to share is a theme we've been talking about throughout this video, which is to vary your encounters. Throughout the course of your campaign, you want to have a lot of different options to pull on so that your combat always feels unique. It doesn't have to be a major change from one encounter to the next, but changing one element there and then another element allows the combat to always be new to your characters and to be more compelling and engaging in that way. Location and environment are a pretty basic place to start. Mountaintop, riverside, desert, forest, tundra. These are really big environmental changes. But more than that, consider smaller environmental changes. I think it's easy to get caught up in the big biome pictures, but even in a forest, there can be very different types of encounter locations. An encounter would be very different in a spider nest versus a woodsman's hut, in a clearing versus a riverbank. If you're not using the environment in your combat, then that setting doesn't really matter. It's just empty description that your players, most of them, won't really need to or care to listen to. But if you let your environment play into the game, if you let the coursing river in the riverbank or on the riverside tie in to what's going on, then all of a sudden it matters where they are. Perhaps the woodman's hut can catch on fire, or maybe there's an axe outside that one of your players or your enemies can pick up and utilize. You don't need to over plan in advance, but being fluid with this and accepting the reality of your world and allowing your players to use that against you in the same way you're going to want to use that against them is going to make the combat much more compelling throughout. Situation and circumstance are another big place of variance. Maybe there's more cover in this encounter, or maybe in this case you want to have your players be mounted or be underwater. A lot of DMs avoid these kinds of combat because they seem more mechanically complex, but I promise you that if you put the little bit of effort required to learn how they work, even if you don't run them perfectly, your players are going to have a ton of fun trying a type of combat they may never have tried before. Why not do a mounted combat encounter against some centaurs on a plane? So maybe the centaurs are chasing you, maybe you're chasing them, maybe there are traps and pitfalls along the way. Difficulty is another major area of variance. I mentioned that with the goblin encounter and I've talked about this in some other videos before. With difficulty, you have an opportunity to allow your players to feel not only totally outmatched at one end of the spectrum, but also like total heroes. I think it's really fun to take players who have accomplished a ton, who are maybe in the level 10 plus range, and have a group of bandits try and stop them. And how fun is it for the players to every once in a while just get to totally trounce your enemies? Not every combat should be a near equal battle. And lastly, we have stakes, and more than that, tension. A lot of what we've been talking about here so far is creative combat resolutions and narrative stakes. How does the combat matter more? Obviously that comes from the plot and from the character's investment in what's going on. And the creative combat resolutions allow the combat to feel unique, not necessarily to the characters, but to the players more importantly. Tension is an after effect and result of all this. In high stakes combats that are very dangerous, tension will rise. And if your combats are always neck and neck affairs, then tension is always gonna be very high. But tension is something that you should learn to manage throughout your game and throughout your combat as well. Combat will naturally be a place where tension rises and comes to a head. With tension comes pressure, and with pressure will come your players wanting to make the best, most optimal decisions, and so they'll take a longer time to figure out exactly what the best move is, as opposed to thinking most about what their character will do in the moment. There's one more guideline I really want to share uh, before we wrap this video up. And that's the fifth guideline, the fifth suggestion, which is just maintain focus. This is kind of an out of character suggestion, less about how you're running the narrative of the game and more about how you're managing the game experience as a DM. As a DM, you're just another person sitting around the table, even though you might have to put more time in or might have slightly larger responsibilities when it comes to maintaining the game and campaign. While ideally the whole table would help keep everybody focused, 
Oftentimes this becomes the responsibility of the dungeon master. And doing small things like making the options your players have clear to them and knowing what your monsters will do beforehand is key to just creating a smooth, flowing, focused encounter. If your combat is slow, your players are more likely to get pulled out of it. When it's not their turn, they might pull out a phone or get distracted, there might be crosstalk, and they won't be paying attention to what's happening in the moment. Most players understand they need to pay attention on their turn, but I find that most overall engagement comes when all the players are invested in every moment of combat, in what's happening from turn to turn, and interested in seeing the decisions that not only the NPCs, but the other players at the table are making. Zipper on Disney has a really great video that he uploaded about making combat smooth and how to add flow to your combat so that it runs in an engaging and compelling way. And I think if you combine what he says in that video with what I'm talking about in terms of making your combat more narrative and creative, you're gonna have some really fun encounters. All right. That's the video. That's how I suggest you can run more compelling combat by presenting your players with creative opportunities to resolve the combat scenarios that they're in and adapting the narrative stakes, making the stakes of the combat vary from encounter to encounter. I hope that this is helpful to your games. If you're interested in hearing more about my thoughts on running role-playing games, including, of course, Dungeons & Dragons, I make new videos every Friday usually about D&D, but sometimes about other creative subjects. I'd love for you to subscribe and stick around. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.